morning, Annette. Um, thank you so much for making time for this interview. It's really a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here and share some of the UNFCCC experience. Okay, great. Well, you're in charge of the global stock take and the periodic review of the temperature goal. And your work also has a strong focus on adaptation. And we will talk a lot about adaptation. So uh, let's uh, start by your specific role. Could you briefly explain the objectives of your work within the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change? Thank you. Currently, I'm, I'm leading the support for the Adaptation Committee, which is an established expert group under the UNFCCC, being the principal advisory body on adaptation, uh, advising countries on adaptation planning, implementation, but also monitoring and review. And I'm also leading the support uh, for preparing the global stock take, which is a, a review, review process of how well countries have advanced towards achieving the objective and goals of the Paris Agreement, plus also leading the review process, which specifically looks at to what extent we're meeting the long-term temperature goal of keeping temperatures below two degrees. Well, since you're in charge of um, reviewing processes and progress, I would like to talk a bit about the nationally determined contributions. Um, so the, the non-binding national climate plans of countries that are created to meet the Paris Agreement. Um, they have been updated. So I understood that countries have to submit these revised versions ahead of COP26. Um, do you see any change when it comes to adaptation within these updated and revised NDCs? Is there a stronger focus? Are demands for financial support, for example, um, more strong? I think, yes, one can say that uh, the demands for financing are stronger. The other thing uh, one has to take into account that the NDCs are mainly a communication tool to communicate what countries are intending to undertake when it comes to mitigation and for developing countries also adaptation. However, the actual planning and, and, and costing of measures takes more place in the process to formulate national adaptation plans. And there we see an advent of those plans uh, where countries take increasingly take a more comprehensive approach and not just look at a, a project in agriculture or a program of water, but look at uh, creating a general national framework of addressing uh, adaptation impacts. When we look specifically at the latest round of NDCs, we can see that the adaptation components have an increased focus on adaptation planning. And also they include more time bound quantitative adaptation targets. So they're not just saying we need to adapt, but they say, OK, in the water sector, we plan to ensure um, that we have sufficient water through integrated water management. And they put some targets in terms of cubic meter of waters. Likewise, they have uh, targets in agriculture where they say 70% of the arable land should be drought resistant. So it becomes very concrete. They're establishing indicator uh, frameworks that would also allow countries to establish baseline where we are today in terms of vulnerability and impacts, but also to allow them to review whether some of the measures taken would actually be successful in the long run to see whether there has been an improvement for say, a vulnerable farmers. In terms, what we're also seeing is that adaptation are more closely linked with the sustainable development goals and that countries are looking for specific synergy and co-benefits also between adaptation and mitigation. That's, of course, also apparent in the health sector, uh, but also in the whole land use sectors that you're ensuring that whatever agriculture practices you have, that you try to reduce your GHG emissions while at the same time ensuring that it remains resilient for, for them. Now you mentioned uh, financing already, and you mentioned the Green Climate Fund, and but also the fact that um, financing for adaptation is not meeting demands of countries. And we'd like to talk a bit about that because we also know that it has been a contentious issue within the negotiations for many years. Now, uh, recently, the Global Center on Adaptation, they tried to prove that investing 1.8 trillion US dollars in adaptation in the next 10 years could deliver 7.1 trillion US dollars in net benefits. 
still, well, although we know this, the adaptation finance gap is very big and it is continuing to grow and it has even been worsened now because of the COVID uh, crisis. So my question is, what is the position of developing countries now when it comes to adaptation financing, um, given this, this new context, the pandemic, <laughs> economic crisis, and can uh, their needs be addressed, especially in the run-up to COP26, but mm -hmm. also in the longer term? So what we need in the run-up to COP26 is clear, simplified guidance and also a certain understanding that if developing countries have gone through the process of formulating their national adaptation plan and followed the guidance, that they should be on a fast track to receive finance and that they shouldn't be second guessed always along the way and being asked to provide 30 years of data. So it's a matter of volume, but also a matter of access. And I think at least the access is something that can be fixed more easily. And of course, in the long run, when we look at these uh, billions of dollars, it's not, we can't expect that to come from public sources alone, whether it's international or domestic, but we also need to tap into private finance. And that's something more for the medium and long term. Right. Yes, I was going to, to ask about the role of the private sector, how you see that, because there is a, indeed a lot of talk about that. Um, and and uh, but at the same time, it's very difficult for the private sector to invest in adaptation as there are not such uh, immediate financial gains um, <laughs> to be won. So, how do you see the role of the private sector in that regard? Do you have any it, examples, perhaps, on, on on what what they could do and how they can also win from from investing in adaptation? Thank you. Uh, first up, we have to also realize that the private sector is not one big. A player, but that, of course, if you look for developing countries, uh, the backbone of the economy for many is agriculture. And within agriculture, 80% are actually smallholder farmers. So while they are a private actor, they themselves need support, be it in terms of getting the data to be able to undertake an impact and vulnerability assessment, but then also um, having some upfront investments, say, in different seeds, in, in allowing them to actually adopt drip irrigation, all of that, uh, to, to be able to acquire those technology, that, that has a certain upfront component, or to, to change the, the building codes once the building codes are changed. So I think there, it's not so much that the private sector has all these financial flows there, but it... What we've seen promising is public-private partnerships where possibly some of the early risk of investment is being borne by the public sector and then the private sector steps in and, and possibly at some point once costs have, have been met and, and, and there's a certain a profit that then they can uh, pay back. It could also be, doesn't necessarily always have to be grants, but you can have concessional loans. So there are different ways to bring in the private sector. Of course, when it comes to the big transnational actors, when you have banks, um, that the the public sector can incentivize the, the private sector by basically putting in frameworks and regulations and, and saying you have to undertake a certain level of risk reduction, otherwise you are not allowed to operate. Uh, for example, if you build a factory in a, in a floodplain, then you take certain measures to ensure that when the flood hits you, that you're basically protected. And then you get a, a, a public loan, for example. Okay, fantastic. And thank you for giving very concrete examples, uh, very concrete responses to these questions. Um, now, moving on, um, a while ago, we uh, were both in a panel discussion on transboundary climate risks in the run-up to the Adaptation Futures Conference. And during your intervention, um, you said that within the UN FCCC context, there is a lack of methodology and tools to measure these so-called transboundary climate risks. At the same time, um, these, these risks are gaining importance. For example, if we look at the European Adaptation Strategy, transboundary climate risks are um, explicitly being mentioned. Um, so my question is, are there any concrete steps now being undertaken to make sure that transboundary climate risks are on the COP26 agenda? And of course, beyond that, in the, in the longer term. 
and, and also related to that, how to move forward to measure and include um, transboundary climate risks? I think uh, as a first step, I think awareness is, is being raised all over. And I think it's, it's, it's good to see that it's being uh, included in the EU adaptation strategy. I think the traditional way the, the convention is set up, we have member states doing their own impact and vulnerability assessment and then they report it. The big question is, how do we then assess, uh, assess the collective progress? How do we look at these transboundary aspects? We will discuss uh, how to review progress on the global goal on adaptation at COP26. And, and we've learned from many parties that they see that transboundary risk is an important aspect of it, that without assessing and, and addressing a transboundary risk, we will not fulfill the global goal. The adaptation committee, the expert body is currently considering methodologies for assessing adaptation needs and will also include transboundary considerations. And we know that the Adaptation Without Borders initiative that has started looking at um, transboundary risk is trying to pilot case studies with the EU. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, they have been overlooked or not being realized in the past. But at this point, it's a matter of learning how to assess those first. And then I think in the second step, we would be able to address them through uh, some policy measures later down the road. And I wanted to talk about this cycle of ambition that was established uh, by the Paris Agreement, so where countries could plan adaptation and report on it every five years and then um, collectively assess uh, progress. Now, um, on this, we know that, and you mentioned this also in the beginning, that Adaptation is very local, it's very context specific um, and, and implementation, of course, also resilience building, it happens at this local level. But at the same time, in developing countries, especially, we see that local authorities, communities, civil society and so on, they typically have little access to finance, also something you mentioned already, um, and they also have limited decision making uh, powers. So how to overcome this challenge? Of, of building the so the the challenge the barriers to effective adaptation at the local level mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's important to recognize that each level has its different responsibilities but also opportunities what is interesting is to note that in the Paris agreement in article 7.2 parties did recognize that adaptation is a global challenge faced by all but with the local, subnational, national, regional, and international dimensions. So if we look at the different levels, the global level, the UNFCCC, what, what is important there is to create the awareness for the need for adaptation. It's also important to ensure that this is the level we're discussing support, the, the responsibility of developed countries to provide support to developing countries and then set up the institutions like the Green Climate Fund to channel support to developing countries. Then one thing we shouldn't overlook is the national level itself, because it's at the national level that a country sets its legal framework on how to deal with adaptation. It's at the national level that uh, incentives for public and private actors are being set to plan and implement adaptation whether it's risk reduction through building codes, but also agreeing on a big infrastructure plan. How do we, what kind of roads will we be having? How flood secure do we want those roads to be? And uh, it's also there where the big uh, plans are being made in terms of where do we want to go with agriculture? Do we want to diversify our economy? Do we think that some of the the cash crops we had in the past will not be resilient. Do we need to move away from, from coffee, from, from uh, corn? So these are things for the national level. Of course, it then trickles down to the local level. And there it is important that some of the national legislation is being uh, not just implemented, but also translated and adapted to a local context. And that decisions at the national budget also then trickle down and, and resources are being allocated at the at the local level. I think some of that is also a matter of of governance and participation, which is not just an issue for adaptation, but for any public policy that how to ensure that 
uh, the local level gets the right say. We have some promising examples in Nepal, for example, they do have a national adaptation plan, but at the same time, they develop local adaptation plans to then see how some of the big issues are being translated. In the Pacific Islands, there's a strong history of engaging the communities in, in decision making. So it's a matter of also representation. And the question, of course, is then to what extent should, should a global process uh, set set any other policies for the local level? So I think we, we shouldn't overlook the national levels. Right. Um, I think it's also, it would be very interesting to have some kind of cross learning mechanism that yes. you mentioned the Pacific. So this, these lessons can be interesting for African countries as well, how it works there. And that, that is also important for the global level to provide a forum for exchanging good practices and lessons learned, because we do have some, some communities say in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa that have I've learned how to deal with droughts for years and years, and they have uh, traditional and indigenous technologies on how to deal with that. So it's important for them to share. Well, it, it's nice for others to know what they have done and if they're willing to share their experiences with, with communities that are now increasingly facing drought. So that we had, uh, we created these four under the UNFCCC and, and, and tried to exchange also that knowledge on technology so that that is very important. Plus, uh, a lot of the uh, climate funds, they also do have support windows for small grants for allowing local communities and civil societies to, to also uh, interact. Yeah. Now, knowing all this, especially the urgency um, for effective climate action, for green transition, uh, what do you expect to see um, or what do you hope to see as an outcome of COP26? I think it's also important to realize that the time for international negotiations as such uh, is not necessarily over, but the new phase has to be about domestic implementation. So countries need to come forward with more ambitious NDC pledges, but not just pledging something further down the road in 2050. We need to take concrete short-term action to allow us, when we do the next big infrastructure project, when we do, uh, whether or not we build another coal plant, these are things needed to be decided now, and they need to be decided at the domestic level. So I hope that while there is a certain focus also from the media and civil society on the conference itself, I'd like to see that pressure building up currently in each and every uh, member state so what are your COVID recovery measures? Is that really green? What else can be done? Are there any plans for more coal power plants? This is where we need to put, put the emphasis to ensure that each and every country implements the Paris Agreement. Very strong need to focus on domestic action. I yes. Guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we have learned a lot uh, during this interview. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, hope to be in touch soon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Looking forward to your work.